recording okay? Is my slides okay? Also, am I supposed to face the camera because I'm usually pointing at my slides and stuff? That looks good. That looks like my presentation, yep. Yeah. Next slide. That was just the introduction. So this is gonna be a little literature centric. Um, second slide, please. Thank you. So this is, well, at this size, it looks not as overwhelming as it looked on my screen, I gotta say. What a relief. So basically, this is the landscape from the point of view of a publication, which links in all sorts of directions traditionally. Ooh, ah. uh, is that a laser pointer or? Uh, it's just a ah, slide director. Okay, thanks. Um, it says my time's up. Anyway, so this is the point of view from a literature, from um, taxonomic publications in the general, like in the classic point of view, references for human researchers, obviously material citations pointing to specimens that are hosted in some institutions. In more recent publications, accession numbers that point to DNA sequences, and then, of course, the taxonomic names that, well, are sort of taxonomic names, and they are what they are, and obviously, publications also cite one another. Or, well, it's chronological, like two publications mutually citing each other uh, would be a little bit of a curiosity. So, but traditionally, these are more human-oriented links, and... Um, hardly ever machine navigable and usually only outgoing in, um, in literature. Now to make this whole thing bi-directional, we have these little three um, highlighted areas, especially between sequences and specimens, it gets a little complicated. The only thing linking the two together more often than never is um, the co-occurrence in tables, like a reference to the specimen and the respective accessions in some table in some publication. So we can establish that link this way as well. And then also trying to link back both um, accessions and also their respective taxa to their defining treatments and also link uh, specimens to treatments and other publications that cite them. Um, do so ideally in an actionable, AKA navigable, something you could click on in a browser and also machine, um, processable way and somehow make sure that every entity has all the links to all the related entities. So basically somebody compared it to a spider web at some point, you have like all these knots and all these nodes in the graph. And basically wherever you start pulling, you pull out like it, it all is, it all ties together and you always get the whole spider web, like also related sequences and other specimens and other things. So, there is a few little, let's say, kinks to work out in these three departments, which I'm going to go through now individually. Ah. First of all, taxonomic names. Well, they're maybe the household uh, example and the easiest kind of case because they're sort of historical approaches at identifiers themselves. And um, the linking works via the names proper, obviously, because well, they are as close to an identifier as it gets, at least historically. Um, but you would need to take care of things like synonymies. You gotta often compare higher taxa um, and authorities in these things. And obviously taxonomy, as much as we wish from a data point of view, isn't as static as we would love it to be. Recently, like Reptilia just disappeared. So what do you do with a 20, 30 year old document on Reptilia? That class just evaporated with all its, I think, four orders, uh, all ending up classes for the time being uh, in Catalog of Life. Is that, uh, yeah, that's why I call it the Reptilia quake, because it's kind of like from a data point of view, especially when you're dealing with legacy literature, uh, represents a little bit of a problem in terms of matching, because taxa move between major ranks and all these things. So um, there has to be a good bit of fuzzy matching going on and scoring. And finally, 
Catalog of Life has come around during recent years to um, issuing persistent identifiers that persist also across versions of Catalog of Life for names and taxon concepts, aka names and the associated authorities. And that's what we import back into the treatments and um, also link the treatments to the respective names in Catalog of Life. And the treatments proper are made available to Catalog of Life via Darwin Core Archives, but um, I will get back to that a little later. So that's the like little bit the the warm up example. I'm sorry, uh, by the way, about like uh, that somewhat uh, torn apart uh, text because um, it looked a little different in my machine formats. Um, material citations are a little bit of a different issue. Traditionally, well, they contain collecting locations, dates, maybe found under a rock or in a cave or on some leaf or up in, up in the foliage of a tree. Um, also, who collected it? So it's a great historic source of the historic and present dispersal of individual taxa and also where the specimens are located. More institution or collection codes, hardly ever both though, uh, which makes it a little harder. And specimen codes have come into vogue only uh, more recently. I have a hard time thinking of a publication from 100 years ago that would contain, contain a specimen code. Um, so on top of that, institution and collection codes change historically. Um, GR cycle, I think the most degree, the highest degree of synonymies I've found was like six or something when I recently checked. So it's not like we have this four letter acronym and we know exactly what institution this is in. We need to compare other things as well. And um, in the end of the day, the link between a material citation and a specimen, they both meet up in GBIF and uh, we use the GBIF clustering in this, um, on this end as sort of a candidate generation and, for, and based upon that, we have developed our own sort of scoring and matching service. But in the end of the day, it is a human curator who has to decide how this is gonna work and um, to, to ensure that only the things that are really the same, like the material citations only, linked to the specimen it, actu it actually cites. How exactly that works, my, coll my colleague Patrick Rouge um, used to, there he is back there, will show in his talk on Thursday. So I will not dive into this all too much more deeply. And, but this requires human curation. And especially with older literature, it's also a little, sometimes they're rather sparse, like, Types and like types of the species can, um, described in this publication will be deposited in the American Museum of Natural History. Is one I remember from the very early documents we started developing with. So the only chance you really have is via the taxonomy, and then you have historical names, you have synonymizations, names change, determinations change, and it is all a little fuzzy and messy, and not all collections are inventoried the same, and it is a really hard um, thing to deal with, but it is what it is. And the literature is the literature. So we got to make do in some kind of way. It gets easier with more, with more recent publications. And if, uh, if it catches on to publish, um, to publish or cite specimens with DOIs, um, obviously that would be almost heavenly because then we have the actionable links right away. But, um, and ultimately, how do we do the linking? It, this works basically via the GBIF record keys for the museum specimens. And we associate those with the material citations whose GBIF record keys we also import back. So basically here, both sides of the coin go to GBIF with the Darwin Core, via the Darwin Core archive. And save the best for last. Um, save the best for last DNA sequences because these have even more and that's where the pitfalls uh, part of my title comes from. Accession numbers, when we started tagging them initially, I learned we're following all these not, like nice little regular expression patterns. Easy enough to implement, a computer scientist would think. 
Unfortunately, these things match a ton of other things as well, like specimen codes that I mentioned before, but also grant numbers, um, zip codes at times even, like in the author affiliations. So we had to, we got a lot of, lots and lots of false positives and like really meaningless links or links in meaningless locations. So we worked together within the scope of bicycle with ENA to actually extract the letter prefixes at least um, that are actually in use at this time. And with that came up with a bunch of schemes that of things that are actually accession numbers that are actually used, not ones that could potentially exist at some point. So we're all good, one would think. I sure did. Um, and we tag these things and what we match, we verify via a lookup to ENA whether or not that record actually exists. Yes, it does. Great. We have a link. Or do we? Um, then we had this one. Then we had this one um, online meeting where we ended up realizing, hmm, we had for some reason linked some arthropod to some human genome sequences because turns out the specimen numbers for this art for this arthropod turned out to be extremely valid accession numbers at the same time only pointing to something completely different so even the existence of or validity of a number as an accession number wasn't enough so we started comparing even the taxonomy of course again with these little uh, with the restriction that we have to be a little fuzzy because species move around genera, et cetera. And um, not everything is determined to species level when the sequence goes into ENA. So, but it takes, it really takes going all the way down to compare, to lookups, verifying taxonomy and everything to actually get to suss out the actual accession numbers, which is a depth that I would have never thought might be anywhere near required to when bicycle started two years ago so this is um so this is just a few experiences that we have with like making literature actionable and making it a first class citizen really of this data landscape and um also giving it or empowering literature to act as the hub between links that it really is because the literature is where it all comes together so how do we how do we propagate the links that yellow thing up there should not be there just yet um, so basically so basically um, associated specimen specimen URIs and record keys go in the Darwin core archives as do the accession numbers and we prop so we propagate all these links um, via Darwin core archives to GBIF and also to checklist bank who also harvest our Darwin core archives and also, to enable, for instance, ENA to link back to us and to the source treatments, we um, expose treatment HTTP URIs together with the ENA and catalog of like taxon IDs and the accession numbers via our own API. And Joanna, how often are you polling us uh, right now? I think once a day. So this is this is how the uh, how the other direction is established, and we are getting this um, this whole inner mesh, and hopefully like a larger and larger and ever increasing amount of data where you can just grab one node and um, get out the whole connected graph. Um, and also this makes explicit the, uh, the link between specimens and derived sequences because we have these co-citations in literature in tables, which we also extract. Now, are there any questions? This is what should actually appear together with the yellow box. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, questions or comments? <laughs> yeah. Masha? Thank you. Uh, just a quick question. So, my understanding is so you're doing text mining on this paper, uh, isn't it? Or in the widest of senses, yes. I'm 
curious because I approached recently a copywriter from the University of Queensland regarding the questions of text mining. And apparently, like, you need to have a constant statement, you know, from the authors, whether they allowed you to do text mining. Is it something that, you know, I'm really, like, I'm kind of curious mm -hmm. about that. Um, under oh. under Swiss law, I can say... Um, yeah, it depends on the country, right. Yeah. Un under Swiss law, we are very much uh, in the green legally to do what we do. Actually, our, our lawyer fought that out in the Swiss federal court. So... Um, in Switzerland, we're fine. Okay, good. Yeah, I was just wondering from the um, legal rights. So, you know, yeah, how the, ar actually. the argument or the un the underlying argument is that a treatment is a sophisticated description of nature, like the ocean is green and wavy, uh, like if in a very sophisticated manner, but say a botanical uh, protologue or something is a highly standardized, formalized um, description. So is a taxonomic treatment within zoology and uh, there is no like say intellectual property it's basically because you're filling in a form if in prose and natural language describing something plus this only applies to treatments not to the analysis and say the overall discussion section you would have in an article um, so we extract the treatments and that's fine and we make them public and we put the OIs on them because we put them in Zenodo Yeah, we, we would put we would put a DOI on the protolog and put it in Zenodo, so it becomes a first class citizen of the reference land, of the bibliographic landscape all in all by itself. And we would also extract any, say, figures and we're working on tables as well. They're a little tougher because quality control is kind of notoriously hard in those. But um, all these really data containers and um, figure documentary figures of say herbarium herbarium sheets. You cannot really copyright because they're documentary. Yeah, that's right. Okay, we have to go on, Guido. Thank you. Thank you. So the next Thank you for your attention. <clears throat> the next talk will will demonstrate Open Biodiff. Open Biodiff is a knowledge graph created by Pensoft through conversion of article XMLs and treatment.